we welcome uh, Dr. Sarah Rubel back from uh, uh, the religion faculty at uh, Gustavus Adolphus to continue her uh, talk on skepticism. Some of you uh, have been interested in her, uh, or have asked about her uh, presentations other than to our uh, congregation. She will be speaking to the life group, learning in retirement group, uh, March 22nd, and also on June 7th. Uh, and if you're uh, interested in that, uh, you can ask me, or if you know the life program, uh, out at the Heinz building, you can get information there. Time Magazine <coughs> had a recent article that's kind of along the line that we've been talking about. Uh, it's called The Rise of the Nuns. Not the N-U-N-S, but the N-O-N-E-S. And I thought I'd just read a brief uh, excerpt from there. Uh, a very American trend, turning away from organized religion, and yet seeking rich, if unorthodox, ways to build spiritual lives. Uh, these people have no religious affiliation, some kind, sometimes called the nuns by social scientists. Their numbers have more than doubled since 1990, and the major surveys put them at about 16 percent of the population. Well, Sarah's going to continue to talk to us about that issue, and I think about uh, young people and skepticism. So she left some of us in the 19th century <laughs> in our belief system last week, but uh, you're going to bring us up to date. Right, okay. Right. All right. you 
most likely stepping on people's toes. My guess is, if I do this right, I will basically say that everything that at least most of you, or something that most of you believe here today can be construed as part of what makes religious skepticism a really powerful option in America. Um, which, since you're here on you know, the spring forward day on a beautiful Minnesota Sunday, I'm going to assume that you have some investment in you know, church and don't necessarily want to see your, your belief system as being part of what has made religious skepticism an increasingly popular option in America. Uh, the point here is not to say that the beliefs are bad or the strategies for trying to think about how to combine beliefs in our life in the modern world are bad. Part of what I'm talking about today is simply historical <coughs> irony, um, which is the sense that a lot of times our best efforts lead in unexpected ways. Um, I, I'm more of a historian than a theologian, so I get to just sort of do the historical irony and then tell the theologians to figure it out. Um, <laughs> But, but as, a, as a Christian, I, 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 do, I, I, I do want to kind of keep two things in mind today. One is just the sense of historical irony, that we're in some places that we helped bring us to, um, kind of regardless of where you are on the theological spectrum. We all helped. Um, and part of what we're trying to do is figure out how to live in this new place and how to witness faithfully in this new place, particularly um, for, for you all right now, how to think about um, sharing the faith to, with the younger generation. What, what do we do now, given where we are? So that's, that's where we're going today. All right, the one, at the very end of last week, I talked about some of the things that contributed to uh, a change in attitude about the relationship between religion and the modern world. The, right, beginning of the 19th century, I said religion had been just married, Christianity had been married to science and philosophy, and then a bunch of things happened which made that marriage much more complicated. The one I forgot to mention, but will come up again, is at the end of the 19th century, a growing awareness of other world religions, but a new kind of awareness. People had known other world religions existed before, but at the end of the 19th century, particularly because, ironically again, historical irony, because of the American missionary movement um, and its growth, people are becoming more and more knowledgeable about world religions and are less and less, at least in some cases, able to say, well, these people are just completely wrong, right? Missionaries go to China and they meet Buddhists and they say, wow, these are really smart people and they live very moral lives, and they have some really good insights into the world, how do we say they're simply wrong? Right? So it's an it's a awareness of world religions, but one at least in some circles with a more positive connotation. OK. Then we said, I've got to tell you that we now have this little clicker thing, and it just it, this makes me so happy. I can hardly say that. I'm very, very easily amused. I get really excited in my classrooms with pens for whiteboard work. So, uh, so we talked about there are two major responses to a, sort of this crisis of faith in the 19th century. We talked about conservative responses and liberal responses. We're going to push those a little bit more now going into the 20th. And I'm going to start with the liberal responses. Um, the, the use of religion, thinking about religious truth as symbolic, thinking about salvation as something basically structural, and thinking about how to identify Christianity with culture, and I'll unpack some of those. Um, so liberal responses, how do you, in the early part of the 20th century, deal with new scientific findings? How do you deal with evolution? How do you deal with new, um, findings in psychology with Freud, right? How do you deal with new understandings of the Bible, with historical scholars going back to the Bible as they were doing in the middle part and the end of the 19th century and saying, you know, this book actually isn't cohesive, at least not in the ways that we've said, right? 
his um, scholars going back and saying, you know those first two chapters of Genesis? Those are two different creation accounts. At least that was the claim, right? The first one and the second one are different, right? And where for centuries people had just said, well, the second creation account is a, a, a amplification of the first, right? These were scholars going back and saying, no, these are different. How do you cope with that? Uh, how do you cope with scientists saying, or, or people who are now kind of scientifically minded saying, walking on water is not possible? You just you don't do that. Um, what are you going to do? Right? One of the one of the, the tactics that people took was again associated with this sort of. Um, what we call the, the liberal response. And I should just stop here, and someone, I forget who, asked me after last class if there was a better way to talk about these different responses than liberal and conservative, because they're such loaded terms in our current culture. Um, there might be, but I don't know what it is. Um, um, so I guess I just need to say really quickly here that I'm using these terms historically and descriptively. Um, by which I mean I am not assuming that liberal means liberal, lily, weak, dopey, mother, nanny, state, evil, I want to take down America. And I'm not assuming conservative meaning means hawk, mean, wants to like, you know, throw children out of public schools, okay? That's not how I'm using these terms. Um, here, there are they're different ways of responding to the relationship between um, religion and the broader culture. And one of the liberal responses was given by a famous preacher by the name of Henry, Henry Emerson Fosdick in a famous sermon from 1922 called Shall the Fundamentalists Win? Um, conservative Christians were trying in the 1920s to get people like Henry Emerson Fosdick um, basically kicked out of the denominations. And, and Fosdick was, as you might imagine, fighting against uh, being kicked out of his denominations. And he was trying to explain the difference between what he saw as liberal ways of thinking and conservative ways of thinking. And, and here's what he says. He's, he, this is a sermon. He's going through many um, sort of hallmark Christian beliefs. And this is what he talks about. Side by side with those to whom the second coming of Christ is a literal expectation, another group exists in the evangelical churches, by which he means the Protestant churches. They too say Christ is coming. <coughs> they say it with all their hearts, but they are not thinking of an external arrival on the clouds. They have assimilated as part of the divine revelation the exhilarating insight which these recent generations have given to us. That development is God's way of working out his will. And these Christians, when they say Christ is coming, mean that slowly it may be, but surely, his will and principles will be worked out by God's grace in human life and institutions until he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Okay. In other words, this is Fosdick saying, well, look, my position, the position of some of my fellow liberals, when again liberal was a thing people were willing to call themselves in the 1920s, is that Jesus isn't going to descend from the clouds as a lot of conservatives thought. Is. Maybe even as Paul thought. Maybe that's what the Bible says. But that's not what we now expect, given how we understand the world. The second coming is symbolic in the sense that what it tells us is about a truer, deeper, richer reality, which is that in the unfolding of history, in the progress that, that human history makes, God's will is being more and more manifested. And in that way, Jesus really is coming again, right? The, the, key, the reign of Jesus, this, this reign of peace that we hope for, is happening through the progress of the world. It's taking the New Testament account, taking sort of the historic position of the church and saying, how can we make this make sense to modern sensibility? What can it mean today? Um, 
which you know, seems a legitimate thing. And, and Fosdick and other places will say, look, we have to make Christianity accessible and acceptable to our modern world, to our increasingly educated world. If we keep asserting these old literal doctrines, people will just laugh at us because they're so demonstrably not the case. Okay, this, is his, this is his position. Now I should say that some of um, a, a Fosdick-like position in the, the celebration of inevitable human progress um, itself over the course of the 20th century um, comes in for a lot of knocks because the 20th century proved, at least for some people fairly definitively, that moral progress is somewhat hard to talk about. Um, this, you know, another way to say this is that you know th there's a real way in which this vision um, cannot explain Auschwitz or Hiroshima, um, and at least has to be rethought. If not, it's not always discarded, but it is rethought. But again, anyways, thinking symbolically, thinking about how God is manifest in culture. Um, again, an identification with culture as part of a liberal response. Trying. Um, again and again to take Christianity into the public sphere and say, look, Christians have a place in public in our modern debates. We have something to say. And these two men who come um, from different parts of the political spectrum are uh, their own symbols of that. Here we have um, Reinhold Niebuhr, a uh, uh, famous uh, Theologian, in some ways, one of the right. I would say, some ways, the probably the 20th century's most prominent public theologian, other than Martin Luther King. Uh, Niebuhr was someone who was really instrumental, or at least was the kind of guy who was invited to the State Department to talk about what Christianity might have to say to political issues. Right? Um, what What does Christianity do to help us think through things like nuclear war? And this sense for Niebuhr that it's important that Christianity speak in a way that's intelligible to the thinkers, the intellectual, the, inf in the influential people of our day. The other man is John Foster Dulles, Secretary of State under Eisenhower, also a prominent Christian, um, again, trying to figure out what does Christianity look like in, in the halls of power? What does this look like when we, when we take it and put it into conversation with the issues of our day? They came up with some different answers. These are not men who necessarily would have agreed with each other. I think some places they did, some places they didn't. But their impulse is the same. Okay. All right. Um, another response, and this is where we probably write could have a good brawl of 12 year Lutherans, so probably not. But um, <laughs> you all were Baptists, we can have a good brawl. Um, but another political question is about the uniqueness of Christianity. What in the face of world religions do we say about the uniqueness of Christianity, specifically about the uniqueness of Christ? Is there something unique about Jesus that we cannot say about Buddha, okay. about Muhammad, about any other religious or even artistic figure, right? I mean, is, is Jesus the sort of spiritual equivalent of Mozart? Or is it something else? Is Jesus something else? Um, and the, the man pictured there is a man by the name of William Hockey, who was a professor at um, Union, it's either Union or Chicago, I'm forgetting, but that the point is, Hockey um, was part of a group that in the 1930s issued a report, the, it's actually the technical term is the Layman's Commission on Mission, but it often became known as the Hockey Report because Steve, Steve Hawking, um, William Hawking, <laughs> different Hawking, um, issued a, 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 a statement at the beginning where he argued that, in, in essence, Christianity is one form that God's revelation takes. We know God's revelation in Christianity, but it's also possible, I think for him really probable, that God's revelation manifests in other forms in other religions. Um,
what this reproach does, and this is, there's a lot of theology to unpack here, and it's complicated, there's ways of talking about it, but the, this approach does two things. Um, and if, I, I'm going to put these as kind of positive and negatives, and I don't really quite mean that in the terms of whether or not it's a good idea, but in the terms of what can happen to kind of Christianity because of this idea. On the positive side, it does respond to real questions Christians has, have about the exclusivity of the Christian message. I mean, do Christians fundamentally believe that everybody else is going to hell? Um, that is something we don't necessarily like to say. So it seems to respond to that issue. It also responds to the whole problem of religious coercion, right? Either explicit or implicit. The sense that, you know, Christians in our world, this is even truer probably in the 1930s, are disproportionately powerful, they are disproportionately wealthy, when they go abroad to spread their message, even if they don't do it with gunboats sitting behind them, which they also had, um, they do it with a lot of economic and political power. Okay. And that seems to be a problem. So Hawking's solution was to say Christians don't have to feel like they're going abroad to convert people. They're going abroad as ambassadors of Christianity, and they're meeting ambassadors of other religions and much like the embassy in Denmark doesn't try and convert Danes into Americans, it just tries to be a good representation of America, that's what Hawking basically thought Christians should do. Now you're not trying to con convert other people, you're trying to converse with them. The problem, or a potential problem in terms of, of the, the Christian church, is a, whether or not it's distinct. And then, Although Hawking wouldn't go here, it begins to raise this question about whether the church is really necessary, right? If the distinctiveness of Christianity is unclear, then was it really necessary for you to get up an hour earlier than you really wanted to on a Sunday morning when it is beautiful in Minnesota and come to I mean, is there really anything here that you couldn't have gotten, say, in bed or over a bagel while reading the New York Times. This becomes part of the question. All right, another place where this becomes really manifest is in the academy. Um, and there's a book by a scholar, granted a more, uh, he's a, a very well-reputed historian, I think he's very fair. He is himself um, theologically more conservative, so that's worth knowing. But, um, George Marston wrote a, a very interesting book called The Soul of the American University. And what you can't see here is what he says, it's from, from Protestant establishment to established non-belief. And basically what Marston is tracking is how a lot of our major universities, not necessarily public ones, but, but major private universities, um, went from places that were basically Protestant in orientation to places where religion is basically off the table. Okay. Um, where you just don't talk about it. It's assumed that if you are religious, that's something you do on your weekends, and you don't, you don't bring it into a lab. You don't bring it into a, a meeting with your advisor. It's just not there. And the question is, how does this happen? Um, and part of what Marsden argues, he may be wrong, but I think it's interesting and probably at least partly right, is that with this um, real identification with American culture, right, that the, that the sort of the liberal response to with culture, um, in order to identify with the culture, part of the price of that was not being particularly exclusive, right? If you want to identify with a culture, particularly a culture that is growing somewhat more religiously diverse, part of what that costs you is you have to be really, really tolerant, which again, we would say is a good thing, right? Um, but Morrison argues that tolerance more into simply saying we can't talk about religion 
if we're going to make room for other people of other traditions, um, we can't talk about it at all. And sort of the price for being part of the culture, leading the culture, was to say, we won't force this. We won't have any sort of, of privileged place for, for Christianity or any religion. We'll just take it off the table. And that was, that was the price. In order to be able to lead the culture, you had to say, we won't be exclusivists. For Martin, as we talk about irony, there is a real irony here. Um, so here's his irony. I'll, I'll give the quotation and I'll explain it. So far as most of the major groups of outsiders were concerned, and here outsiders in America, he's talking uh, in the 1940s, 1950s, Catholics and Jews by and large. Soon after World War II, they were welcomed into the academy. So Protestants saying, we're not going to try and control the conversation, did a great thing. It allowed other people into the conversation, which is good, right? But here's the kicker. Only if they played by its rules. The academy was defined as a scientific enterprise that might be complemented by higher humanistic ideals. These ideals might be associated with organized religion, but in that case, except for some of their moral teachings, they should be regarded as private and kept from interfering with the main business of the university. Those from other than mainline Protestant cultural and religious heritage groups were welcomed in, so long as they checked the particularities of their beliefs at the door. In other words, as Protestants said, we're not going to coerce but we'll stop like forcing our religious faith on people, which again is a good thing. He said, and the way we'll do that is we'll just, you know, take religion out of the public sphere. Well, that meant everybody had to take religion out of the public sphere, not just Protestants. So if you are, say, an Orthodox Jew, right, you too have to keep your religion out of the academy, basically. Do that on, you know, Friday nights and Saturdays. But it's not something we, we bring in. Um, this is when people talk about secularizing what they need. Right? You make public places places where there's no religious influence, or at least put it that way. All right. So if the liberal response is we're going to try and show that we are part of this world, we can respond to the scientific to the you know, sociological changes in our day. We can, with the best of them, be part of a diversifying America, right? We're gonna really try and do this. Um, what, again, some historians would argue has happened is you identify with the culture and then you end up looking a lot like the culture. Um, and then, once you end up looking a lot like the culture, you have a hard time making an argument to put it most bluntly again, why people need to show up here on a Sunday morning or show up at a Presbyterian church. I mean, if, if the church basically looks like the culture, then what's so special about the church? Why come? Conservatives have a, a different um, orientation. As I said about um, the, at the very end of last week, Conservatives went a different route. Um, and this is particularly true after 1925. Picture here, uh, famous picture of two men at the Scopes trial, the 1925 trial in um, Dayton, Tennessee, about whether or not evolution should be taught in public schools. Okay? Um, I just, right, the Scopes trial just makes me happy because it's so hysterical. Um, it's, 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 it's so much fun. First of all, this is not real as well. This is tangential, but we're going to take this tangent because I think it's fascinating. And I have the microphone. Uh, and the clicker. I've got the clicker. So I'm right now. I'm just, you know, um, if I were not Methodist, I'd be wrong with it. But I do <laughs> <laughs> get from a lifetime of great shoes. Uh, okay. Uh, where was I going to Okay. So this is. And then I'm sort of, I'm almost, I am really actually evangelistic about the Scopes trial. Um, 
So if you have ever seen Inherit the Wind, right, please understand that that is a really interesting movie about McCarthy. It is not a particularly good movie about the Scopes Fry. Although I do still think it's interesting for having one of, to my mind, or to my knowledge, one of the few roles that um, Gene Kelly ever had that was completely without singing or dancing. Um, but the, the movie, right, projects this image where the, the, the teacher is going to, well, he's thrown in jail, like his, you know, his life is really hanging in the balance here, and um, on and on and on. Completely untrue, all right? And this, there's this town of uh, men who want to, like, enforce religion. Um, not the case. The Scopes trial actually occurred because the ACLU knew about these anti-evolution uh, laws in states and they believed them to be unconstitutional. They were looking for a test case, right? That's how you start working things up through the courts. The town fathers of Dayton, Tennessee heard about it, met at a soda fountain shop in Dayton, Tennessee, brought in a young, wait for it, PE teacher by the name of John Scopes, who had occasionally substituted in the biology classroom, and asked him if he would be willing to stand trial. Um, he was in no danger of going to jail. The penalty for teaching evolution was a hundred dollar fine, which William Jennings Bryan, who opposed evolution, paid for him. Okay. Um, so it's right, the whole thing's hysterical. Anyway. Um, the consequences are very real. And this is William Jennings Bryan, the anti-evolution crusader, and Clarence Darrow, the famous trial lawyer, who, um, and this, this part matters a lot, um, the, the last day of the trial, um, Darrow put William Jennings Bryan on the stand as an expert witness on the Bible. And it was important because William Jennings Bryan was not an idiot, right? Um, he was a three-time, he was a three-time presidential candidate, which I realize doesn't prove you're not an idiot. <laughs> 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 um, now I'm giving his credentials of mine. He's not an idiot, right? He'd been, he'd been Secretary of State. He was, he was actually, he was a thoughtful guy. Okay? He was a thoughtful guy. Um, he could be wrong about things and on race. He certainly was, but he wasn't actually, he wasn't a political conservative, right? He had, um, resigned as Secretary of State because he refused to take the country into war during World War I. He's basically a pacifist. Um, he supported labor unions. But he was also opposed to, to evolution. And he got on the stand um, because Darrow was a brilliant trial lawyer. And then Darrow began to ask him a lot of questions about a literal reading of the Bible, which William Jennings Bryan couldn't answer, basically. He was a great stump orator. He was not a good witness. And at the end of it, Darrow basically got um, Jennings to admit that he couldn't explain a lot of things and that he himself didn't read the Bible literally. He, for instance, didn't necessarily believe in a, in a seven day, 24 hour creation. Um, what that did, functionally, and I'm getting back to a point here, is it convinced, or was part of a series of events <coughs> that convinced conservatives, at least some conservatives, that they needed to get out of the public sphere. They were done. The country was mocking them. Um, America was probably going to hell in a handbasket, and they were going to let it happen, at least in the short term. And historian Joel Carpenter describes this, and says there's an irony here, irony is coming up a lot, I realize. Fundamentalists turned to independent ministries in part to compensate for the services they lost when they became disenchanted with the agencies of mainline Protestantism. In other words, these conservatives, or at least some of them, leave their old denominations. They leave the Presbyterian Church, they leave the Baptist Church, they leave the Methodist Church, um, and they form these independent networks. Okay, that we know today, you know, there are places like Moody Bible Institute and Wheaton College and um, the uh, Sunday School Times was a really famous periodical. They form these sort of independent networks to make up for the fact that they no longer have access to everything that's available in, in mainline Protestantism, the old established churches. Um, 
And but then here again, for, for Carpenter, here's the irony. But by pursuing these survival tactics out on the margins, fundamentalists started a trend that has led to the weakening of the most central and powerful corporate expressions of American religion. Right? So in other words, by draining the mainline churches, right, and starting these independent resources, they they became they helped make American Christianity a house divided. So that mainline Protestantism isn't as strong as it was, but neither are the people out on the periphery. And there isn't now in America, and whether or not there ever really had been is a question, but certainly to the extent that there had been this sort of strong centrist public witness, it doesn't exist in the same way. Um, and, it, and it leads to, to splintering it through the lack of power of everyone. Um, the other conservative response here has to do with conversion. Okay, and then the famous, my, my first book here is the famous evangelist Billy Graham. And um, Christian Smith and Michael Emerson, two sociologists, argue that for white conservatives, the situation is different for African American conservatives, um, but for white conservatives, they have a way of thinking about the world that stems from their understanding of conversion. Okay? So for many, not all, but many white, what we call evangelical or conservative Protestants, right? Conversion is a moment when I make the decision to accept God's grace, right? And it's, right, I, I have this, this really powerful moment where I wasn't a Christian, I hear that I'm a sinner, and I decide that I will accept Jesus as, often the language is my personal savior. Right, it's a born again experience, and this may right this may be the experience for some of you in this room. Although again, it tends not to be a uh, experience that is talked about quite the same way, at least in some Lutheran circles, because what it doesn't talk about a whole lot is baptism. Right, there's a sense that if you were back in this world, if you were baptized as a child, that really doesn't mean anything, right? Because it wasn't voluntary. And what counts, and this is important, what counts is my dis voluntary decision. My voluntary decision is what makes me, it's what makes my faith. Um, and they call this uh, <coughs> accountable free will individualism, which is a mouthful. But what they're emphasizing there is that in the conservative side, what, what counts is my decisions, and I'm responsible for those decisions, right? But my individual decisions. Um, I'm gonna, the relationalism for our purposes isn't all that important, but the anti-structuralism is, right? If I am basically made who I am by my individual decisions, institutions, don't necessarily matter as much, right? They might be kind of convenient things, but they're not necessarily all that important. Now that may all sound abstract until you say it this way. The body of Christ can be thought of as an institution, right? Or at least something larger than the individual. So in this way of thinking, it's not always clear if the individual, well actually I should say probably actually is clear, the individual can be understood apart from the larger body, or if the body actually is what gives the individual meaning. I would say for a lot of conservatives, they're first and foremost individuals. Right? I made a decision. <laughs> and then I choose to become part of a larger body. Now, again, that, although conservatives would not necessarily think about it this way, just as uh, 
liberals don't necessarily think about themselves as right, just conforming to the culture. Conservatives tend not to think about themselves as conforming to the culture. But you can make an argument that conservatives in their individualism have perfectly conformed to a highly individualistic American culture. That, that, that same sense of the importance of the individual that we see so much in our culture is replicated spiritually in how, again, white evangelicals particularly understand their religious experience. Okay, so what does this all mean? Like, where, what happens? Well, part of what I'm getting at is to say this. Over the course of the 20th century, Christians have had to try and sort through how they're going to respond to modern circumstances. And you can make an argument that both of the responses, the conservative responses and the liberal responses, have led to a situation in which you have a hard time explaining why being, why being part of a church matters. If on the liberal side, it's the sort of sense of, is there something different in the church that you don't get from the culture? Is there anything, you know, is there any there there? On the conservative side, there's the question of whether you need any larger body in order to have your individual faith. Um, and what I would argue even more than that, right, I mean, individual, you know, really committed conservative Christians are still going to come to church on Sunday morning, and really committed liberal Christians are still going to come to church on Sunday morning, right? But the bigger issue is probably for either group explaining to anyone else why they should, right? Or to put even maybe a finer point on it, explaining to your kids why they should, right? If faith is an individual action, why do I have to go to church on Sunday morning, right? And if basically church does a lot of the same thing as the culture, well, why do I have to go to church on Sunday morning, right? This becomes the question. Um, and we can see some of this is happening in American religion, and, and this goes to, to what Bob was saying. Um, this is my first attempt using um, Excel Microsoft as a, as a pie chart. Um, I was pretty excited. Um, but you can see this is a, a rough breakdown, and this is from a 2008 uh, survey of American religion by the Pew organization. So it's four years old. Um, but you can see here the two big, these two big chunks, evangelical Protestants here, Mainline churches here at 26 and 18 percent, respectively. Um, historically, African American churches at about 7 percent, and Catholics in America at about 24 percent. Okay, so Christians of some sort think, making up, um, you know, I'm eyeballing it, but about 75 <coughs> percent. Um, and then we have, um, and I, this is a terrible thing to do, and I. Did any with sort of other Christian Orthodox? Um, you, you stick in groups. You start uh, how they fit is a little bit hard, but you know, Christian Science, Mormons, all in here. Um, Four point six percent world religions. So this is Muslims, Jews, Buddhists, Hindus. Four point six percent. And I want to stop and just note that for a second. A lot of the rhetoric. I mean, that is sort of out there in the water about skepticism in America is all about you know other world religions, right? How this has changed everything. Well, it's changed a lot of things. It has, right? Particularly since 1965, when immigration rules changed, and there really has been a significant growth of other world religions in America. I think that's true, and I think. It's something that we need to think about. But a couple of things to note. We're still talking about less than 5% of the population. Right? Um, whatever's happening to American Christianity is probably not primarily that. Second thing, and this is 
somewhat related, but I, I just want to flag it. Um, again, a lot of the rhetoric out there is that the, everybody who's coming here now, you know, is not Christian. Right? That's just manifestly untrue. Okay? Most immigration to the United States comes from most immigrants from to the United States comes from Latin America, which is primarily Catholic or Pentecostal. Okay. Overwhelmingly Christian. The other thing sociologists have noted is that there is something of a select self-selection process. So even people, um, I think that the last number I heard was about two thirds. Okay. People who come from places we associate with a non-Christian tradition, those people tend disproportionately themselves to be Christian. So to put another way, um, a, a, a disproportionate percentage of immigrants from the Middle East are Christians coming to America. Some of them, yes, are Muslim, right? But in, in disproportionate numbers to what they are in, in the Middle East, they're Christian. So just to keep that number in perspective, there's I think a lot of, in some quarters I would call it hysteria, um, and there's I think no reason for it. Okay, it's, that's not the number to care about. <laughs> the final point is I think, to go to Bob's point, this is the number that I think actually does matter for Christians. The 16.1 um, of people who are unaffiliated. They're in some cases atheists, but that's a pretty small number. In some cases, they're agnostic, but again, a pretty small number. What most of this is are what Bob said, the nuns. Spiritual but religious. And by and large, that 16.1%, just by dint of how our population is, right? These are, if they're not our kids, they're our grandkids, or our great-grandkids. They are people who at one point were part of either churches or synagogues, and they're not anymore. I think that's, right, this isn't the number, right? This is the number to really sort of think about and wrestle with. Okay, what's happening there? And I would argue that, that part of what's happening there are these sort of streams that we've seen. The, the plausibility structure around belief has changed. Um, Christian belief actually, I would argue in this culture, seems less and less plausible to a lot of people. And even if it doesn't seem less plausible, the church itself seems less necessary. Right? Why do I need an institution to support my faith? Why do I need creeds? Right? I decide what I believe. Why do I need any sort of, why do I need to spend time in committee meetings? I mean, let's be frank, right? Churches are sort of profoundly annoying, okay? Um, right? You end up, right, I'm sure you all love each other a lot, but I mean, in some churches, uh, but not the ones we go to, but in some churches, right, you end up spending significant amounts of time with people you would not normally choose to spend time with, okay? You spend time in meetings. Right, on issues that seem, right, not always all that important. Um, it takes a lot of energy. And if there's nothing really here that's different, or if I'm actually the best arbiter of my own religious experience, I can do this all much more efficiently and effectively on my own. Okay. I think that's part of what's going on with that number. The sort of why bother. And uh, Christian Smith, who we saw a little while ago, has um, recently written a book that I would commend to you. It's the, the second book that's part of a study he's done on the religion of teenagers and emerging adults. And the one on emerging adults looks at uh, 18 to 23 year olds, I think is the age range. It's called soul searching. And Smith has um, a, a section on what he calls the cultural world of emerging adults, or sort of the, the basic beliefs of this cohort. Okay? Now again, this isn't all of them, but overwhelmingly 
on the self, right? So again, I am sort of the arbiter of all that is, and I'm not sure that there's anything objective or knowable outside my own personal experience, right? Um, right and wrong are easy. Everybody knows them, they're intuitive. Which goes to how not to hurt others is self-evident. They're really convinced that you shouldn't hurt other people because that would be wrong, right? And then they're really pretty sure that it's easy to figure out how not to hurt other people. Whatever will constitute hurting other people, everybody knows, right? Um, all cultures are relative. Basically the same. You have your beliefs, I have my beliefs. Um, and then relative morality depends on the case. All action is situation. And so this is what Smith says about it. Um, it says, one of the apparent effects of this culturally relativist view and the continual self-relativizing to which it leads is speech in which claims are not staked, rational arguments are not developed, differences are not engaged, nature is in the natural world, reality is human is not referenced, and universals are not recognized. Rather, differences in viewpoints and ways of life are mostly acknowledged, respected, and then set aside as incommensurate and off limits for evaluation. To put that in sort of easier terms, it's what I see in my college classrooms when someone will say, well, this is my opinion. Another student will say, well, this is my opinion. And then they will have decided that the conversation is over because having stated their two respective opinions, there's no place to go. There's no way to have a conversation because I am the arbiter of my own reality. Right? So you have your opinion, I have mine. And that is done. And what Smith does not quite say in his book, although knowing him, I think he probably would say, um, and I'll say it for him, um, or on my behalf, um, I, I think that this is a problem, um, particularly in a democracy. And I think it's a problem that the church actually has something to say something to, um, although it's a hard thing to say, right? Having decided that we don't want to tell people we're right and you're going to hell, which I think is a good thing you've decided to stop saying. I do think the church has something to say about where we ground our beliefs. Although I think we are tentative about saying it, and that, that might not be completely bad, there is a sense that there are some things that are better than others, and that those aren't simply instinctive. How to love others well is really actually, I think most of us who lived in the world for any amount of time know, pretty hard. It's hard to do, and it's hard to figure out what that even means. And it's not something that individuals, I would argue, just know. It's something we have to be taught. Here's where Smith says the kicker is. A lot of the students he talks to assume that church might have something to teach you about that, but they've taught you everything they've got for you by the eighth grade. Right? Lutherans and Catholics and Presbyterians call it confirmation or catechesis. And then the church has done its thing. Right? I think for those of us who want to say that there's something here, at least one argument we might want to think about making is that the church isn't just a place where we teach stuff, although that is also the case. The church is really sort of a laboratory in which we try and figure out what it looks like on the ground. Right? I think it's also more than that, but that's at least part of it. Part of the reason you show up here right, every week is because you learn to love people here. And we need to keep learning that. We don't just learn that you should love people, but we actually have to do the hard work of figuring out how. 
But again, I think we live in a culture where it is not self-evident, right, that you need practice of that. Right? We have to make that case. Um, I would argue that we have to show, right, 14 and 15 year olds that we're not done with them when we have, you know, taught them stuff, but that there is a life of formation to go through. And to, to push it up a little bit more, that there is sustenance for that formation in the church that you don't get anywhere else, right? Lutherans would talk about it as, as Eucharist, right? There is there's something real that happens here that isn't just out there everywhere. But again, I think in a world where none of that is self-evident and people are no longer convinced that any of that is necessary, I think it's an actual case we have to make. And to end it before I ask a couple questions, I would argue you have to make it in a world where people assume, particularly young adults, assume that all claims are spin. They're not actual claims that can be buttressed by rational argument, right? They're simply claims that bear maybe some relationship to reality, but maybe none at all. <coughs> and that all claims are primarily about power and self-interest. Um, this is a hard world in which to have an argument. And that's basically what the church, I think, if we're going to make an argument for our own sort of existence, um, this is the world we deal in. And by argument, I guess I should say, I don't think we need to be beating people's heads. We need to be showing that what we have is, is <coughs> being. All right, I want to be conscious of the time, but maybe a couple questions, and then you guys can, you know, figure this all out when I'm not here. <laughs> Talk to you all in the session. Yeah. Um, kind of what's annoying by your we'll all find you uh, position of the fundamentalist position, uh -huh. that by um, you know, saying that the church is not the seeing Christianity as something that is based on an individual's uh -huh. selection, it sort of feeds right into the postmodernity. Yeah. You know, I am. I decide what's true. Mm -hmm. And. Um, and boy, that would be an anathema to Luther. Yes. Yeah, right? I mean, this is this I mean Luther thinks God is real and whatever God is is true. Right? And again, I want to be really careful because there's a difference, I think an important theological distinction, if you want to go here, between saying God is real and whatever God is is true. Right? And saying, and I know absolutely what that is. Right? It is possible to say, although it, I think it is hard to actually live out well, I believe that whatever God is, is true, and I think God has revealed God's self to us so we can talk about God in meaningful ways, but I'm still not claiming to know everything. This is a difficult epistemic, what we call the academy, epistemic humility, right? It's that really hard thing of saying, I've committed my life to living a certain way. There are things on which I would stake my life, and I could be wrong. That is a hard way to live. I think it's, for my money, a faithful way to live, but I do think it's a hard way to live. So I, the two other options, right? <clears throat> I'm actually convinced of these things, and I know I'm right and you're wrong, is easier. And I don't think there's any truth out there to be known, so there's only my personal perspective is also easier, right? The, that, that middle way, um, I think is faithful, I think it takes a community, but I also think it is, it's harder on, in all sorts of ways. We like, we like certain certainty, either the certainty that we're right or the certainty that there's no certainty to be, certainty to be had. Okay. 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 As a scientist, uh -huh. this postmodern idea also affects our culture's view of what scientists. Oh, absolutely. 
<clears throat> so it's not just a problem that we have as Christians nope. or as religious people. Right. Is that our authority or yep. scientific authority is now questioned because there's this my personal view trumps. Right. Right. What about the actual evidence? It was cold last winter, so global warming is not true. Right. <laughs> 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 but, not but not this right. So we have to put my hands on it. And it's cold again next winter, we may lose them. Right? Yeah, but it's that, that sense that there's no. Because there's no, we can't say things with absolute certainty, there's no argument to be had. And right, science is a great place to say, well, no, we continue to have arguments. And we may right, find out in 100 years we were wrong about something, but we can talk about real evidence and real processes. There are real discussions that you, that you can have. Um, and I think culturally, you're right. I mean, we're, I mean, Smith's claim, I think, is that anyone who wants to make that kind of argument is swimming upstream um, in, in, this current, in this current culture. And again, it's hard not to be one of the groups where you're saying, no, this isn't just spin. Like I have, you know, I have numbers. Thank you so much.